Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Good crowd tonight. And it's been good all through the week. Good crowds and good number. And I appreciate you being here. It's wonderful. Um, we have, and I want to say it very clearly, that um, <clears throat> the, the purpose of this conference was to set in order right doctrine. And that's the way we feel. That's the way we feel. Got to be careful hooking up with angry men. Y'all want some scripture? I'll show you this in a minute because uh, we're going to show a video here in just a moment. Uh, Proverbs 22, 24, make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man thou shalt not go. 29, 22, an angry man stirreth up strife and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Ecclesiastes 7 and 9, I've got a bunch of them, I just, I'll just give you a few of them. But, but uh, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. From 16, 17, 18, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ by their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And that's why we're having this because we have some young people who are being sucked into this vortex, which is silly stuff. And uh, we have a very angry man at the end of it. So that's what it's about. I don't want y'all to think that it's just a, just a little spat. It's a doctrinal thing that's affecting churches and infecting churches and infecting some and causing division. And people, people that were here, preachers that were here this week, said they've lost quite a few folks from the church because of this individual. You'll see why in a minute. Y'all look at me. I've been here 35 years. If that man right there would have the spirit that you're about to see, he would never preach in this pulpit. There's no preacher that I've ever had could preach any harder than some of the preachers I've had. If you're scared of hard preaching, you need to go somewhere down to Cappuccino Church down here. We believe in hard preaching here. Ain't nobody can, nobody, we love it. We love it here. Ain't, but we, your spirit got to be right. If your spirit's not right, there's something wrong. And I've been in this long enough to know that stuff will manifest itself one of these days in a crash and burn. Sure as I'm here. Now I want everybody to understand something, something else. That I'm the pastor of this church. Brother Gip is not the pastor of this church. Nobody else is that, and that dude sure ain't. Yes, sir. Amen. So I don't have to agree with everything that was said this week, nor weeks before. You don't even have to agree with everything I say. Uh, I, I'll, I'll determine myself through some of the studies and some of the things that were said this week myself. There's some things I've heard, a few things, this, just a few things this week I heard that I, I've never heard before. It's fine. I, I will settle that with my heart and my Bible. And the, are you with me now? But he is my friend, and I trust him that he's saying the right thing. And if he's not, I'll correct that. How's that? How's that? I, I'm just simply saying it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I hope that I stand to be corrected by the Word of God. I hope you are too, sir, and if you're not. Anybody sitting in this pulpit, if they can't be corrected, and that's the problem. These guys have preset situations. They will not be taught by anybody. They already got it down. Nobody can teach them anything. I could be taught anything. Just, just prove it. Show it to me scripturally. And we'll settle on that thing. So that's what I want you to understand tonight. And thank you for being here. Father, bless tonight, we pray, <clears throat> that you would speak to our hearts in a real way. In Jesus' name, and amen. And I also want you to know that my father was a professional boxer, and he always taught me never, ever to hit girls, and that's why I don't. <laughs> and some of these, I, no, no, if you get the blog, some of you ain't fooling me. You got on the blogs all the nasty, filthy stuff that's being said about us two. I just don't hit girls. My daddy taught me not to hit girls. You say, well, they're, they're watching. I know they're watching, but I mean, if, if they want to, they can. A flight is cheap to Chicago. Direct, man. Yeah. Come face me. Yeah. He said, well, that's physical, man. Much well, okay, but I mean, if you're man enough to say it, why don't you just say it in my face? Yeah. Instead of hiding behind a little screen and a mouse. Yeah. Mice hide behind a mouse. <laughs> Come face me, dude. That's all you got to do. Now, now, now my spirit's getting bad. I better quit right now. But anyway. So uh, we're going to watch this. If you can't see this, can we take this down? Some of you guys, come just take that, just take the board down. 
put it right over there so this, this side can see. Just put the board down. No, no, just the board, son. There you go. Okay, just put it down right there. All right. Hey everybody, Pastor Steven Anderson here from Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. Tonight I was tuned in live listening to Sam Gipp preach at Keith Gomez's church where they're having a conference against yours truly, preaching against after the tribulation, preaching against marching to Zion, etc. But what I heard tonight was so shocking and mind-blowing, I can't even believe it. Sam Gipp said the most blasphemous, satanic thing that I've ever heard in a Baptist church and nobody batted an eye. The pastor gets up at the end and, oh, great job, Brother Gip. And just nobody even stops the service and says, whoa, buddy, you just crossed the line. You're teaching wicked, wicked doctrine. He actually got up tonight and said that Jesus' name was not supposed to be Jesus. His parents named him the wrong name that they were basically not following instructions when they named him Jesus and that, you know, we know him as Jesus, but that that was not supposed to be his name. And then he even said, just in case you think, oh, it was a misunderstanding. Then he says that when Jesus Christ returns, no one's going to call him Jesus. At his second coming, nobody's going to call him Jesus because that wasn't even what he was supposed to be named in the first place. I mean, I can't even believe this. I mean, I thought it was bad when Sam Gibbs said that Jesus was not his Messiah. That was nothing compared to this. I mean, this is just way more blasphemous. This is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. And it's, look, it's not just weird. It's satanic. It's demonic. It's wicked. It's evil. Jesus is the name above all names. And the Bible's crystal clear in Luke chapter 2 that that name was given him by the angel before he was even conceived in the womb. That was the name that God gave him. And to sit there and say, oh, well, he was supposed to be called Emmanuel, but his parents got it wrong. And then the big dumb animal, Keith Gomez, just sits there and listens to him preach this and gets a good job on Israel. Well, it's funny how you're so interested in defending Israel, but you don't care when the name of Jesus is attacked. I mean, look, you're going to hear the blasphemy for yourself. Listen to the clip yourself. I mean, you, you probably don't even believe me. But when you listen to it, it's clear what he's saying. That, oh, the angel told him to name it Emmanuel. And the lying fool starts reading in verse uh, 22. And he conveniently skips 21, where the angel tells him in Matthew 1, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He was commanded by the angel, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Go. Sam Gibb starts reading in verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken to the Lord by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That's not even the angel talking. That's the book of Matthew telling us what scripture is being fulfilled in the Old Testament. His name is Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, it says that he was given the name of Jesus by the angel before he was even conceived in the womb. That ain't name came from God. Look, even Linus reading the Christmas story in Charlie Brown gets it right. And Sam Gipp is evil and wicked and foolish and any pastor who allows him to preach in their church if they have heard this clip that i'm about to play is just as wicked and evil as he is and if you go to a church where sam gipp is on the itinerary to come preach you need to demand that he be canceled or your pastor is wicked and a partaker of his evil deeds to put this evil blasphemer behind the pulpit who uh, has the gall to teach this bizarre demonic doctrine about the name of Jesus. And listen, Keith Gomez, your church is filled with idiots. You, congratulations on your church. I know you think that your church is so big and you're so, such a big name or whatever in fundamentalism. Your church is filled with retards.
Keith Gomez, because if anybody in your church had a brain, they would have heard that wicked blasphemy. They would have got up and walked out, or better yet, they would have stood up and rebuked the demon, Sam Gipp, for blaspheming Christ in such a wicked way. And anybody who has Sam Gipp preach or listens to his preaching after they hear this clip is just as evil and wicked and demonic as he is. And there's, don't make excuses for it. Don't, there's no excuse for this satanic, creepy doctrine. Listen to it yourself. Let me, let me show you something. Go to Matthew chapter 1. It's just better to look at the book for this. Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, this angel's talking to Jake, uh, Joseph. Joseph finds out that Mary's with child. He's going to dispose of her in a nice way. He doesn't want her killed. She should be stoned because she's been, she's been immoral. That's what he thinks. And so he wants to put her away quietly. And an angel comes and talks to him. Can anybody guess the name of the angel? Absolutely. It was Gabriel. It wasn't Michael because he continues on. Anyway, and, and look what it says. Verse 30, uh, 23, behold, uh, verse 22, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Remember these words, God with us. You know what? If you say in Hebrew, Emmanuel, the E-L is God. Emmanuel, you are saying God with us. If somebody's name, I preached for a guy named Emmanuel in the uh, Philippines, uh, that his name is God with us, okay? So, <clears throat> Emmanuel means God with us. So, this angel comes to Joseph and says, don't put her away, this thing is of God, and this baby's name is going to be Emmanuel, Right? Verse 24, then Joseph, being raised from the sleep, uh, from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth the firstborn son, and called his name Emmanuel. No, he didn't call him Emmanuel. He said, hey, you're going to have a kid? His name's going to be Emmanuel. He says, hey, Joe, she had the baby. What do you call him? Jesus. <laughs> Say, what? how could that be? Real simple. God with us. The Bible says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Instead, we know him as Jesus. And what does Jesus mean? It means Jehovah saves. Oh, that's what we need, isn't it? We need Jehovah saves. But he never got this. Now, I don't know if I mentioned it yesterday or sometime earlier. Before the Lord came to the manger, it, the Trinity was in heaven. Nobody ever said, let's go by the throne and see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They said, let's go by the throne and see the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. He got that name Jesus when he was born. Now, one of these days, the Lord's going to come back. He's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. He's going to rule the universe, correct? And nobody is going to say, well, let's go to Jerusalem and see Jesus. They're going to say, let's go to Jerusalem and see Jesus. God with us. You say, are you sure about that? Well, there you have it, folks. You heard it right there for yourself. The wicked, evil blasphemy that Keith Gomez thought was such a wonderful sermon. Look, somebody needs to hold these so-called big name preachers accountable and take them to task. And this Sam Gipp needs to be canceled from every meeting. And look, if your pastor is having Sam Gipp and you show him this and he's still having Sam Gipp, get out of that church because your pastor is probably just as demonic as he is. Look, and look, if you're watching this video and you just heard what he said and you think it's okay or that there's an excuse for it, you know what? You're not saved. There, I said it. You're not even saved because nobody who has the spirit of God living inside of them could listen to that evil, blasphemous doctrine and think that that is acceptable and think that that's okay. You are still in darkness even until now. You are blinded. Sam Gipp is an unsaved, wicked, false prophet. And any pastor who has him come preach after hearing this 
is just as wicked and demonic as he is. And let me tell you something. We need to get this message out. Take this video and tweet it, blog it, share it on Facebook. Look, we need to take it to task. And I'm not going to let this go until every pastor who has him scheduled to preach either comes out and says, Oh, I agree. I agree that the name of Jesus was some plan B afterthought, uh, you know, a screw up by his parents. Or they cancel Sam Gipp, the demonic false teacher. Look, we need to take these people to task. We can't just sit back and let this traveling circus, Sam Gipp, travel to 50 churches a year teaching lies and infecting churches all over America with this evil doctrine. And if you're watching this video and you think what he said was okay, you're not even saved and I have nothing more to say to you. Does that sound like a little girl that just lost his boyfriend? <laughs> now you need to understand he's watching this right now. He's hearing everything I say, but he's a, he's a girl. He's a little girl. Anybody with that spirit, something's wrong with that man right there. Simple as that. I've been telling you that some of you are a little not there, and I've also been telling you a few of you are lost. I didn't know that all of you were lost. <laughs> now i got something to preach on Sunday, but anyway. You know, a lot of churches were blasted by these guys. That's what I'm trying to say. Y'all look at me now. They're causing division, trying to split churches and telling people they ought to leave churches. Um... And I, I don't want to, I hate to bring this to your attention to show you this, but I mean, some of you members look up here and you don't pray for your pastor and your church. You don't even know this. This is just, this is mild. This stuff happens all, all the time. I never talk about it because my daddy taught me not to hit girls. But churches were blasted by this today all over. They got the emails and they blasted everybody. I had preachers text and call me all across the nation laughing at this mess. And um, uh, it just, it's just a mess, but that's what happened. So you got to understand in the last days, that's, that's what you got going on. So if you couldn't tell by that man's spirit uh, where this thing is at, there's something, there's something wrong with you. I personally believe that what you ought to do is avoid his, not only his blog, but his, his, um, his, um, his website by, by all means. Get sucked into that vortex of that sort, sort of spirit. The problem is that people are, going over there because they're weirdos they, you know they either hate the queers or they hate this or they hate that or they whatever and then they'll fly there and they'll join his church and that's how his church is growing more than anything it's because people are moving to his city to be a part of a weirdo all it is is a westboro wannabe yeah. y'all remember the westboro church that's all it is a wannabe that's all it is and uh, he wants to be the man um he got his little fanny whip down on the border by a border guard a little skinny Mexican border guard, he don't want to come challenge me. He's just a punk. Have I made that clear? Okay, Mr. Gipp, you're on. Good to be saved. Oh, wait a minute, I can't say that to you anymore. <laughs> I, hey, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a heretic, demoniac, all this other stuff. Listen to this. Oh, this, this is Jesus Christ talking. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Now your pastor said to notice his shirt. I hope you notice something else. When he went like this, there were no nail holes. If you went to Jesus Christ and asked for eternal life, Jesus Christ said he would not cast you out, but Stephen Anderson just did. Now I don't know what I've ever done, but it can't be as bad as calling Jesus Christ a liar as for every time that someone is sitting here. You look around at this crowd. Yep. I, I did have one guy call. Uh, all the, I hate to tell him, man, all, my, all the guys I preached for, none of them said, I don't know I want to have you in. But I had a guy call, and, never, and he was not hostile. And he said, well, I just want clarification. I said, here's what I was, did you notice how I cut it off where he saw, saw the scripture? Yeah. This guy lives on sound bites. Now, that wouldn't be bad, but you 30-somethings and down, you live on sound bites. Right. So he's got your drugs, right. all right? But this guy called and he said, well, I just want some clarification. I said, I was showing the irony that it should have been God with us end up being uh, uh, Jehovah saves. I said, now, let me ask you something. I said, he called me lost. He said, Jesus Christ was a liar. 
He was a liar when Keith Gomez went to him and uh, Keith thought he got saved, but he really didn't. And every person in that church, Jesus Christ lied when he said if they'd come to him, he wouldn't cast them out. I said, don't you want a little clarification from Stephen Anderson on that? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Isn't it funny how somebody wants clarification with one guy and not clarification with another? Yeah. I have never called Jesus Christ a liar, except that tonight he'll find some twist and he'll go, you keep going to be liar. It is obvious Stephen is off his lithium. <laughs> Guys, look, he, he says, and this is not personal. People say, this is personal between you two. It's not personal. Let me say this. I, this is not the first time I've done this conference. And so this is not the first time I have introduced this message with these words. I wish him no evil. He's got nine children. I hope nothing happens to those nine children. I hope none of those children, when they grow up, cease to, not, to live for the Lord and break their hearts. I don't. I don't want anything to happen to his wife. I don't want anything to happen to, his, to him, to his health. I don't wish anything bad on him. You say, well, you're talking about a, a local church pastor. Uh-uh. I'm not messing with his church. He's messing with this one. He condemned everybody here to hell because he doesn't like what I, what, who you have in. Like, like every pastor in the country now has to get their speakers approved with Stephen Anderson. No nail holes, Steve. No nail holes. Why don't you try putting those in? That'd be fun. It might be, it might be more convincing. But guys, when I go into churches, church after church after church, and here's what he's doing. Uh, people are watching him on the internet. And they're getting messed up. And now he's got people, they join churches and proselyte. I cannot say he is uh, instructing them to, though he does tell people, if you're a member of a church like this one, don't leave, just pass my stuff out. And his church is not growing from his door knocking in Phoenix. It's growing from his proselyting. He is a wolf. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, a couple months ago, there was a church in Canada, had a big, uh, had a big uh, teen thing. They finished it up Sunday morning. And a young couple came with some teens, and they liked the church. And uh, that night, the guy came back and started passing out this guy's material. Just came to the church, started passing out to people. And the pastor said, you're not doing that here. He goes, well, I like this church. I want, I want my teens to be part of that youth department. He said, your teens won't be part of this youth department. He said, you, your wife, your kids, you leave, you don't come back. So the next Sunday, two other families came and started doing it. How's that for in your face? And that's, that is disrespect for a, a local church pastor, isn't it? So if there's any local church pastors listening to this, remember it's Stephen Anderson that's plucking your flock. So, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him. And this is, now, now let me say this, let me say this. Whenever you want to sell something, you know what you do? The first thing you do is you destroy the competition. You, you say something derogatory. You know, I have to laugh. Uh, people, they, they used to go to restaurants and they liked it. It was good. Then somebody said, they freeze their food. Come here and you don't get frozen food. Oh, okay. We'll go over this. The food isn't frozen. Okay, we're eating here where they don't freeze the food. But their eggs are from chickens that are in cages. <laughs> Did you ever notice how you never had a problem until somebody came along and made one up? That's what this guy does with my preaching. But what he does about the rapture is he says that, that nobody taught the, the pre-tribulation rapture until it started with, with John Darby in 1830. Now, I was talking to the students today. A lot of, a lot of schools are Calvinistic. Do you know how a lot of students get roped into being a Calvinist? They show up and somebody says, are you a Calvinist or an Armenian? I don't know. Well, what do, they, what do they believe? Well, an Armenian believes you can lose your salvation and a Calvinist believes you can't. Oh, then I'm a Calvinist. I'm telling you that they make something look unattractive. So he tries to make the, the uh, pre-tribulation rapture like, oh, it's only been around since 1830. I'll deal with that tonight. Don't worry. If that scares you, if I was like him, I would have had the message that, that says anything about him personally, the very first message. I gave you scripture. 
He, he cannot refute. You saw he had to cut the scripture off of his little sound bite. Right. And he cannot handle scripture. He did that rap thing because he couldn't handle scripture. He is against the Bible and he hates this church and he hates everybody in it. And that's why he condemned you to hell. Now you think about that. Right. Right. He says every person in here, he has revoked salvation that Jesus Christ gave you. Right. And, if a, and if a pastor isn't upset about that, I have never done anything that, that a guy should be that upset about. But uh, he started, he, he went to a church in, uh, in um, Sacramento. I talked to the guy that was his pastor. In fact, he claimed to come out of that church. The church disowned him. They put him out. He still claims to, go, uh, to come out of that church. Uh, they said when he went soul winning, uh, his description for when he was soul winning was he was a rude jerk. Well, well. You say, oh, you're making it up. Then why did he have the sheriff called on him seven times? Why did people whose doors he knocked on have to call the sheriff on what he did on their porch? Have you ever had to do that? Uh, so so he, he uh, showed up at some kind of a Billy Graham conference with a sign that says, Billy Graham is going to hell. Now, this is what he's always been sensational. By the way, you may not realize what you were looking at, but you're looking at a millionaire. Right. He waged a war. You know these guys that are, that are waging war on our police right now, the communists right. and the Democrats right. and the liberals? Yeah. Right. He waged war on border guards. Right. They would get out of their car. They would walk in a line. He would, get it, he would confront border guards. And he pulled up to a border guard uh, one time, a, a border checkpoint, and... They said, sir, roll down. He wouldn't put his window down. He wouldn't even look at him. Well, they had enough. They bust the window, drug him out of the car, beat him up. No, no, no. It was the wrong thing to do. It was the wrong thing to do. And he got over a million bucks for it. Isn't that funny? Because ever since he got his check, he doesn't care about the border car crossings anymore. Isn't that funny? I mean, you know, I'll bet your pastor, uh, I'll bet he thinks abortion's murder. And I'll bet he just keeps on thinking it. I'll bet he believes the King James Bible, and I bet he just keeps on thinking it. And then it's funny, this guy thought that border checkpoints were evil until he got a million bucks out of the government, and then he didn't say anything wrong with them anymore. You know, the Bible does tell you to beware of men that are given to change. Now, he ain't given to change, he's given to hard cash. Now, uh, I call him a 12-year-old. People think I'm doing that to be derogatory. I am not. Now, he says things about me uh, to be derogatory because he wants people to think that. He says I'm demoniac. I'm not. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm, he says I'm ignorant. He says I'm not, I'm not intelligent, which, okay. Uh, I was telling the guys today, I said, you know what you never want to do? You never want to walk in with, with your arm in a sling and your head bandaged up and an eye patch on. Somebody said, what happened to you? He said, got beat up right. by a midget, by a midget. Yeah. with one arm. Right. And he was drunk. Right. <laughs> I was telling people, fight a giant, you know. Yeah. And um, uh, this, this guy, uh, he, he, uh, he got his, uh, I, I got him to call me. Here's what happened. I wanted to talk to him. I, my, here's how I got, a, I got associated with him. Uh, Paul Wittenberger who is another millionaire with him, who is his, he's the guy that makes his videos. Paul Wittenberger probably put the, uh, the rap video together, I'm guessing, okay? Paul Wittenberger worked on a pornographic movie. I told, I told the school I, I wouldn't tell him, I won't tell you either. I won't tell you that it was a pornographic lesbian movie. The guy that is screaming how demoniac I am his good buddy, who has preached in his church. I've got a video, I saw it's online, of, of Paul Wittenberger preaching in his pulpit. A man that made a video, a lesbian porn video. And he doesn't like who he has in. So you ought to think about it, all right? Anyway, uh, this Wittenberger called me some, several years ago and he said, would you, would you debate S.L. Anderson on the mid-tribulation rapture. I didn't know who S.L. Anderson was. I said, uh, no. And he said, why not? Now, now, guys, let me tell you something. The Bible does not speak well of debate. And all debate is, is, is show off my brain. 
And he said, why not? I said, well, because I've, I I've never seen a debate where one of the guys said to the other one halfway through, you know, you're right. I'm going to quit believing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join you. <laughs> and I said, I've never seen a debate where no matter what is said, both sides claim victory. You know what a debate is? A debate is, is for the sport of you guys watching two guys fight. So if you want to debate, you go debate somebody. I'll watch you. But I thought, who in the world is this Stephen Anderson guy called out of the blue? And I told him this. I said, um, my thing, for, better, for lack of a better way, I said, my thing is the King James Bible. Guys, I'll take all the prayer I can get. Look, look what he's doing to me. I get the same thing from the anti-King James guys. I mean, I am getting this all the time. I'll take your prayers. I will take your prayers. And I said, my thing is a King James Bible. And I said, if I'm going to debate this guy, I'd have to. I said, I just, I just, I just think it's a stupid thing that we're going through tri halfway through tribulation. I said, and I just don't feel like studying now. Well, then I was talking to a 30-something guy because I knew he would be up on this. If it's, and I said, uh, you know a guy named Stephen Anderson? Oh, yeah, he's all over the Internet. And, uh, and he began to tell me about him. And, I, and I, so I went online uh, and I saw a couple of things. I thought, I got to talk to this guy. Now, in, this, in his, in his uh, video, now here's what he did. Oh, by the way. Paul Wittenberger said, you ready for this? Stephen Anderson really likes your stuff on the King James Bible. He used my information to make a video so we could get the, get the confidence of King James Bible believing Baptist pastors and people like you. Right. I'm sorry, people, but just because a guy says he believes in King James, when a guy says I'm a King James guy, all of your shields go down right. and you welcome them in. So he used the, the, the Bible teaching and the, and the years of study of a demoniac so he could get confidence with people like you so he could get in and mess you up and mess up churches. And so, um, and in his, in his uh, after the tribulation these days, uh, after his tribulation video, uh, he, knows, he does know this. He knows he's got to have a second witness. If he doesn't have two witness, mouth of two witnesses, so he's got a guy by the name of Roger Jimenez. And Roger Jimenez uh, pastors a church, Verity, I think, Verity Baptist Church in uh, Sacramento. Now, now, here's what I think. I think, oh, you know what? I'll bet you Jimenez is out of his church in Phoenix. And, and, you know, Anderson said, come here. I just need a second voice. Speak when I tell you to. So I called Jimenez. I, call, I tried to call Anderson, and whatever number I had, I couldn't get to him. So I called Jimenez. And, uh, and, I, and, and I, look. Jimenez probably hates my guts too. I don't dislike this guy. He's an Air Force veteran. I appreciate his service. I, I don't want to say anything bad about him because I, I just had a very pleasant talk with him. He seemed like a very nice guy. He is wrong about the tribulation. If he follows Anderson on anything else he teaches, he's wrong there. And probably he thinks that I'm demoniac uh, whatever too. So, um, uh, so I called Jimenez. Now, let me ask you a question. When I get done talking to Jimenez and hang up my phone, do you see this? Who does that anymore? <laughs> so when I got done hang and I hung up the phone, what's, what do you think Jimenez did? Now, think about what you, you already knew, didn't you? You know this guy is leading a cult. That, that everybody that, that talks to him about this guy, he needs to report into the master. So I gave him a half an hour, 20 minutes, whatever it was. Uh, and I let him, I figured he's talking to Anderson. And I said, but I want to talk to Anderson. And I bait this guy all the time, Anderson. In fact, in fact, I'll tell you what I did to him today. Um, well, you know, it's fun. Um, uh, so, so I thought, if I call him in as again, two calls in one day from me, he's, when he calls Anderson the second time, Anderson's going to call me. So, and I just, you know, hey, uh, Jimenez, it was a nice day. What color is your car? Uh, you know, I really just talked to him. He was a nice guy. I got done hanging up. And when I hung up my phone, I said, Anderson will call me within the next 30 minutes. 20 minutes later, my phone rang. Guess who? Anderson. I had him. And uh, what I do, and I, oh, man, I shouldn't tell you this. Kind of, I do feel kind of wimpy about this. I tweet. Yes, I do. And, um, and he has guys that follow me to monitor me. And so every now and then I'll say something that will, will draw them out and they'll get into a discussion with me and I'll walk into a trap intentionally 
because he watches, but he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to look bad. So he waits until he thinks, oh man, Gip is going down on next one. So then he comes out of the woods, out of nowhere, and blasts me, and I slam the door on him. And then he, and, and back into the darkness. So he called me. And I said, I was, I was uh, cordial to him. I said, your mid-tribulation rapture theory. Now, to be honest, I figured he probably got it from Mar Marvin Rosenthal. Marvin Rosenthal was the first modern name uh, that said anything about it. Well, it's the only guy. But, um, and, he go, and, and, and the guy is very narcissistic. I mean, you have got to love yourself if you think people who disagree with you are, are, are unsaved. Right? right? right. right. My sin, your sin. Anybody. He probably visits heaven and tells them doctrine. And so, um, well, he went to heaven and plucked you and me out of God's hand. That's how he must have done it. So I said, where'd you get your, I said, so, so if you didn't get it from Rosenthal, I said, did you get it from Rasmussen? He said, no. I said, where'd you get it from? He said, when I was 12 years old, I read Matthew, I read Matthew chapter 24, verses 29, 30, and 31 after the tribulation these days. And he said, I knew right then. Now, can I ask you people something? Did you believe something stupid when you were 12 years old that you have left behind? Now, aren't you glad? Because if you didn't leave it behind, you'd be like him. And that's the truth. In fact, if you will visualize him with a 12-year-old mentality, then those kind of actions make sense. There are two Stephen Andersons. There is the real Stephen Anderson, and then there is the scripted Stephen Anderson. If you want to see the real one, he used to put a little camera, I don't know if he still does it, because I, I, don't, I don't follow him. I don't chase the guy, I don't look at what he's doing, I don't spy on him, I don't have to watch him. I'm not paranoid about it, but he's paranoid about truth. So he's got this camera on his, uh, you know, he used to have these, this sermon. He, he'd preach and he'd have a camera shooting down on the pulpit and it's stationary. And in that one, he throws his tantrums. And I mean, he throws a tantrum like a kid. He gets mad. Now, guys, I told you, it's one thing to, you know, Bible thump and stuff. But he kicks the pulpit just like a child would kick when he was mad. Yeah. Takes his Bible. Guys, I've never, I have never been disrespectful to that no. book this book that he loves, and he got mad, and he threw it in the pulpit like a toy, like a, like a child mad at a toy. From his pulpit, he, he cussed, told a guy, get the hell out of my church. In fact, you know what they told me at the college this morning? The college was, they got a bunch of emails from his groupies, and he said, didn't you say, Brother Mike, they were X and R rated language? I'll bet you if you wrote somebody, you would not use that kind of language. Out of the abundance of the heart, what? So that's what he generates. So um, anyway, so if you see that, that's the, that's the one, that's the real Stephen Anderson. Then there is the, the, the scripted Stephen Anderson. And the scripted one, that's where you take eight, look, I've done, I've done production videos. You do a scene about eight times. The editor says this one looks the best. Do you know that anybody can look intelligent for 20 seconds? Right. Now, I don't think he managed it in that video. No, right. no. But then it wasn't edited, was it? Right. Right. That was him. Right. That was the raging maniac. Right. So I said, so, so we, we got done talking. You know, we had no problem. I, we got done talking. <clears throat> but I had heard, I'd start hearing, I start hearing, guys, every place I go, I'm telling you from around the world, I, today, here's what I did to him today. I, I baited a trap, or I didn't, I set one uh, a couple of months ago. I have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to YouTube, go to Sam Gip channel, it's there. And, and I uploaded a video, but I did not, I did not um, publish it. I did not post it. It's just there. And it's really, I think it might even be this very sermon tonight. And so um, uh, I put it on there, and I thought, I'm going to wait until I can get Stephen good and mad. Because then he'll start a row. And then I'll put my video on and everybody will watch it. When I put a new video on, I get about 100 views in the first 24 hours. When I walked in here tonight, I had 83 in two. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, I bet he's seen it a few times. Anyway, so so there are two Stephen Andersons and the and the scripted one. The scripted one. Look at the look at his look at his production videos, and he's very rational. Oh yes, we see this. Oh yes, we must do. That's all. He needs a script. He needs an adult. He needs an adult to tell him how to act. And then they look at the best 10, 12 takes and say, let's put this one in. That makes him look intelligent. And he's not even doing his own study. And I'll show you why that's true tonight. But now we we'll start. Let's get to this thing right here. John Darby started the pre-tribulation uh, uh, rapture theory in 1830. Surely, surely, at least one person in this room, when I put that on that, on that board there, felt insecure. Oh man, you mean we got a doctrine that only started in 1830? You know what nobody ever does? Nobody ever asks, when did his doctrine start? When did the, when did the post-trib, pre-wrath doctrine start? Who started it? Here's what the guy can't stand. What the guy can't stand is that he's not first. He doesn't like being, he doesn't like not to be first. That's why he won't admit. Uh, I talked to his former pastor. He said he had nothing to do with Roland Rasmussen. Roland Rasmussen led his, par his grandparents to the Lord. His dad listened to Rasmussen's tapes all the time, and he grew up listening to Rasmussen's tapes. So he got it from a man. But he can't, he, he's got to get his revelations from God. He got a revelation everybody here from God is lost. All right, the guy that uh, first did this was a guy by the name of Robert Van Campen. Of all things, from Chicago. You should be ashamed. Oh, man. Robert Van Campen. You know, I think I did, I did, I did. I want to spell his name wrong. Okay, Stephen Anderson will have me blaspheming Van Campen. <laughs> now, this has nothing to do with pork and beans or anything. Anyway, Robert Van Campen was saved, as near as I can tell. He's a saved man. Uh, and, um, and he was a, I think he had a company on investing. It was, it was an investment guy. Uh, and he made millions, made millions. He was a millionaire. Uh, I can't tell you anything about his character. I can't tell you he was a bad man, good man. Uh, doesn't seem to be a lot of bad stuff about him, but if, around 1979, Van Kempen just decided he didn't believe in premillennialism anymore. He didn't believe in postmillennialism anymore. He didn't believe in the pre-tribulation uh, pre, uh, pre rapture anymore and manufactured the post-trib pre-wrath theory. He made it up. That's when it started. This doesn't come from the... The, the, the second century. It comes from the 20th century. So Van Kampen, uh, he, he died in 19, uh, either died in 1999 or the year 2000. But Van Kampen uh, took his, uh, he, what he did. Now, let me, I told you the other day, I think, that preachers love millionaires because we're the perfect team. Preacher has ideas with no money. Rich man has money with no ideas. <laughs> now, you know that does sound funny? But if there's a smart man, well, you know, you guys, if there's a smart man in here, you know, I always tell people, I always tell people at church should never buy tracks. I think some very smart person ought to buy all the tracks. Wouldn't it be nice if you bought all the tracks for this church and then every time one got passed out, something went in your account? And you got a college here that's training people and you got a, a church that has missionaries and everything you put in here, it does get you something on the other side. Uh, I was telling the students, the second, I think the Understandable History has been through, I, I, I think, uh, seven or eight uh, printings, my Understandable History. Some, some man on his own just bought the second printing. When I, was, when, I done, when I was done with the first one, he paid for the second printing. Well, I think this. I think anybody that, that read that second printing and got straightened on the King James Bible, don't you think it's going on his account? Okay, so it really is. Preacher and a millionaire. Which millionaire do you want? Anyway, preacher and millionaire is good, a, a good uh, thing. Now, so, so preachers will take money from millionaires. You know what they won't take? Doctrine. <laughs> right. Right. Hey, pal, sign the check, shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
I don't care how much money you got, bucko. You're not going to influence a preacher. They're going to look at you like, hey, money bags, just give us the check and we'll do God's work. Yeah. <laughs> so he needed a preacher to legitimize. He, he actually wrote a book about it and it didn't do anything. The book didn't do anything. So that takes us to 1989. In 1989, Marvin Rosenthal. Marvin Rosenthal was the head of uh, Friends of Israel Ministries. And Rosenthal, in 1989, Rosenthal and Friends of, of uh, Israel Ministries had a split. And Rosenthal left. Uh, he has, I think it's now called Israel My Glory. I, well, he's, I, I don't even know if he's alive. He might be with the Lord now. Um, but here's the problem. He's now out of a job, which means he needs a ministry and a paycheck. And it just so happens that, that he and Van Kempen are friends. And he is a preacher. And suddenly, he believes in the mid-tribulation rapture. So he wrote a book. But he doesn't have any money. So Van Kempen paid for the book. Now, let me tell you something else about preachers. We love books. We won't spend two cents on a book that we know has bad doctrine. But you can give us one on plucking chickens live, and we'll, if you're giving it to us, we'll take it. Oh, I'm sorry. Animal cruelty, Stephen. You'll probably make a rap video out of this. Anyway, um, preachers will take any kind of a book free. So, so Van Campen paid for the printing and then mailed them across the country free. I remember getting mine. I got mine. So, so in 19, this, this book came out about 1990. Now, those are the first two. The third guy... Because there's one problem with Rosenthal. And the problem is, he's not an independent, King James, Bible-believing, Baptist pastor. So there's a fellow in Southern California by the name of um, Roland Rasmussen. All right. Roland Rasmussen. I'm telling you guys, I have... I don't have anything bad to say. See, I don't have to, I don't have to rip these people up. He, as near as I can tell, this guy took a church in 1970 with 75 people, and by the mid-80s, he was running 1,200. Now, if you took that like, so what? You're sorry. I, I'll tell you what I believe. I, and I'd heard, I'd heard about him. Uh, he believed the King James Bible. Uh, I, believe he's, I believe he's probably a good pastor, I bet he was a good preacher. He just, in his later years, got messed up on the mid-tribulation mid rapture doctrine. But he's, and by the way, now, now it's 19, uh, let's see, I, I think I got, the, I got the, his, uh, the year. Oh, 2003. 2003, when they were going to do the, uh, the video for uh, after the tribulation, Roland Rasmussen is 83 years old. And they need a young guy. And that's when this guy comes along. Stephen Anderson. Now, it just probably kills him that he is not number one. He's number four. But that's what he is. And if you ever listen to the, to the video after the tribulation, it has a narrator. You know who the narrator is? 83-year-old Roland Rasmussen. And he got nothing from Rasmussen? Didn't know him? No connection? Never met him? So, so this guy comes out <clears throat> with this video. The first video he came out with was a pro-King James video because he knew that would fool you. And it did. And it fooled a bunch of pastors. And then he sent, after the tribulation, oh, guess what? It was purchased and sent out free. Because a preacher might buy a video he's interested in seeing, but if he knows it's bad doctrine, he's not wasting his money on it. So they sent that one out free, and they sent out um, marching, marching to Zion, that one. Uh, they sent both of those out free. So Rasmussen, uh, and, and I, like I said, I don't know how his church is doing. He's in Canoga Park. It just struck me. Canoga Park. Uh, California, 
Uh, and um, he is the voice on that, uh, on that video. Right. Now, about this date. First off, their doctrine showed up in print in 1990. So if this date for the, for the, for the pre-trib rapture bothers you, why doesn't that one bother you? Because that's 160 years later, right? So that's what I'm saying. This guy, will, he'll show you this to try to make you feel insecure. He won't tell you the other half. Did you ever talk to anybody and you said, hey, you lied? I didn't lie. I just told a half truth. But they always tell the wrong half. He never tells you when his doctrine showed up. And it was 1990. But still, what do we do with this? See, I'm not trying to smoke you over here so you ignore that. Because I still don't like the idea that I'm teaching a doctrine that popped up in the 19th century. Leads us to a guy by the name of Ephraim The Syrian. Sounds like a professional wrestler. <laughs> I, mean, you, I can just see this guy climbing over the rope. Oh. Anyway, uh, Ephraim the Syrian. Uh, Ephraim the Syrian is a fourth century Christian. He, uh, he published a, a work in 373. Uh, in fact, I have been bumping into the guy. Um, I'm teaching a Bible history class and I was doing some research because one of the guys said, I heard that Ephraim Syri the Syrian isn't real. And I said, he's very real, but that's the new thing. Probably the guy on the video is trying to put that kind of stuff out to diminish his testimony. But I was doing some research on um, Justin Martyr, Tatian, uh, uh, Clement of Alexandria and Origen. And when you get to Clement and Alexandria and Origen, they were, they're about contemporary with this guy, and they're making references to him. And so Ephraim the Syrian was, was a contemporary with Origen, fourth century. Okay? He wrote a work. See if I wrote the title down. He wrote a work. Um, here's what he said. Oh, it's called, here's the name of his work. He wrote this in 373. It's called, On the Last Times, the Antichrist, and the End of the World. Okay, so I think it's plain what he's talking about. Here's a quote from his book. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come, and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of their sins. We call that pre-tribulation rapture. He wrote a book called The Book of the Cave Treasures. Um, he tells people they should prepare, we should prepare ourselves for the meeting of the, of the Lord Christ so that he may draw us from the confusion. His term for the, for, for the tribulation was sometimes called, he called it the confusion. He may draw us from the confusion which overwhelms the world. So guys, there's a guy in the fourth century. Now, I don't know if you noticed but that's just a little bit before that. <laughs> so now you've got Stephen Anderson teaching a doctrine from here that is contrary to a doctrine from here. Now that's a little bit different, isn't it? All right. Let me get rid of these. Uh, here's what he said about the rapture. Uh, we ought to understand thoroughly, therefore, my brothers, what is imminent or overhanging. He believed that the rapture could happen in his day and that it would be prior to the tribulation. Um, he said uh, at the end of the world, at the final consumption, he said after one week of that sore affliction, tribulation, uh, they will all be destroyed in the plain of Joppa. So he believed in a seven-year tribulation, and he believed that we would leave before it started. All right? Now, 
The other problem with Anderson, amongst the many, uh, is his uh, dishonest Bible, Bible study. He is not an honest Bible teacher. He, he says this. He says that the word tribulation uh, appears 22 times in the New Testament. It does. He's not dishonest when he says that. In fact, I got all 22 right here. And um, so he says, and then he says this. Now, now, what he does a lot of is bait and switch. And so he says, well, 90% of them are about the tribulation. But here's what he does. If you want to watch it, um, see if I got the, I put it, I put it down by the minutes. Uh, at, at minute 26 and 30 seconds, he says the, tribulation, the word tribulation appears 22 times in the New Testament, then shows a list of the references. Now, if you divide 21 by 3, you have one left over, don't you? Okay? So I'm watching this video. I'm going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And there's only 21. And he says there's 22. And I'm telling you there's 22. And I thought, well, now why does a guy have only one verse, or, or, or 21 verses for 22? So I looked. And here's why. Because in Romans chapter 5, verse 3, it says this. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So it's 22 times in 21 verses. Okay? Now, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I talk about the word translate in the Bible in some form. Translate, translate, and translation. And the word translate appears, I say it this way, it appears five times in three places. The first time is in 1 Samuel chapter, 10, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. The second time is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. And the third time and the last three appearances are all in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, where the word of translate in some form appears three times in that verse. So it appears, it appears five times in three places. He says it appears 22 times, and then immediately after saying that, he says this about... Shouldn't one of those 22 verses? Now, why doesn't he know that it doesn't appear in 22 verses? Why doesn't he know that it appears twice in one verse? Why doesn't he say it appears 22 times in 21 verses? I mean, the guy didn't even look at his own video. Somebody made him up a pretty chart with the, part, with the verses up there, and he never even looked at that. He might have scratched his head and wondered where number 22 went. Then he might have done some study on what somebody handed him. So he doesn't even do his own work, except the hatchet work. He does that. Whenever he's off script, he's like this. He's off script and off lithium. And he says this. He says that the majority of the, of the tribulation verses, uh, the, where the word tribulation appears in the New Testament, um, are about the tribulation. Guys, I have uh, one, two, three... Four or five. Five out of 22. Out of 22 times, five out of 21 verses, isn't that about one-fourth of the time? If somebody says 90% and you find out it's fourth, if somebody tried, if a bank said, oh yeah, we'll give you 90% interest. <laughs> oh, really? And it's only a quarter? A quarter might be good now, but you, it isn't 90%. And so he, he claims this. But then he does this, and this is, uh, this is one of the funniest things I've ever saw. It, remember I was telling you there are some rules to, to uh, Bible exegesis that we didn't make up, we just follow. Um, who's talking, who are they talking to, what are they talking about. Have you guys ever heard, I'm sure I didn't tell you the first time, the law first mentioned. Sure. And I told you, that's pretty much the first time something is mentioned uh, that describes it for the tribula as a tribulation. So he goes to, um, he says, let's look at the law first mentioned. With this. Now, what, does he what did he just say? He's going to go to the first reference of tribulation, right? Uh, yet hath he no root in him. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. Yet hath he no root in him. Talk about the, the seed that falls on the ground. But dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He says that's the tribulation. I say he's 
smoking something. Now, here's the problem. This list, I stopped too soon. You say, well, why'd you go from 22 to 26? Because the, the word tribulation appears 22 times in the New Testament, but it appears four times in the Old Testament. So if you say, let's go to the first mention of the tribulation, why would you ignore the first four? In fact, why would you, why would you ignore this one right here? Because that's the only one in that list that qualifies as the, as the first mention of the tribulation, correct? You want to see what the first mention of the tribulation says? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, here's what it says in verse 30. He's, no wait, does anybody know, could somebody just give me a wild guess when Moses wrote Deuteronomy, who he's writing it to? Yeah, he's writing it to the Jews, correct? When thou, you Jews, art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient unto his voice. Guys, that is a reference to the tribulation. The latter day tribulation, and you know who he's addressed to? The Jews. And Stephen Anderson doesn't want you to know that. So, so I, there's, a Bible, there's a Bible rule called the law of the first mention. Stephen Anderson has one called the law of the fifth mention. Okay, that's what happens when you just turn this guy loose with the Bible. He gets himself in trouble. Uh, he does a lot of that bait and switch. And what, in example, look at, uh, look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. We looked at that. He said this is about tribulation. Now, it says, Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution. Now, guys, guys, he says, Tribulation Tribulation or persecution, right? Um, by saying or, is he saying, is he saying they're the same or it's one or the other? If you pull up to a traffic light and you say, do I turn left or right? Uh, do you want red or green? I mean, the or means that they are not the same. So here's what these guys do, and this is the kind of people that he attracts. What he attracts, he attracts the, uh, the uh, conspiracy people, the people I told you, you know, they think that there's a, they're, they're dropping chemicals on us from airplanes, and there's, uh, uh, there's uh, concentration camps in Alaska. Guys, I preach in Alaska. <sighs> you know that's the biggest geographical state there is, and you could not put a secret camp in Alaska because... Because it is the smallest social state. You talk to any native up there and say, where do you live? And they'll go, oh, I live in Anchorage. But I used to be up in Barrow. That's clear up at the top. And then I lived in Point Lay for a while. And then I came down to Fairbanks. And then I w they live all over. You couldn't, put, you couldn't put a camp. You could put it in Tennessee in the, mountain, in the hills, but you couldn't do it in Alaska. But every now and then I say there are. When I'm in my letter, when I write my letter, I tell the liberals. I heard this when, when, when Clinton got elected. One of his groupies said, he said, now that, he, now that Clinton's in, in, uh, in the White House, they, talking about us, they can't put us in those concentration camps they have for us. What a revelation. We think they got them for us. They think we've got them for them. Let's not tell them. Next time you argue with a liberal, say, now, where do you live again? Uh, we're going to be taking you to the camps. <laughs> and so every now and then, uh, I'll put in my letter, I'm going, I'll be on the Arctic uh, this, uh, this year, I believe. And um, I'll say I'm going up to the Arctic, checking on the camps we have for the liberals. <laughs> so he says this. He says, persecution, that verse, 
is his proof that persecution and tribulation are the same thing. Now, an adult would not make that problem. But a 12-year-old might not. I'm telling you guys, when I tell you he's 12 years old, this guy has got problems here. You saw it. And that's not the only video he does like that. The guy's an absolute maniac. He prob they probably put him on lithium for the, for the uh, script stuff. Now, now, here's how I define these two. And it's, it's a, a biblical definition. This one, tribulation, I call it an act of God. That's just stuff happens. Tornado hits your, your house. You fall down to break a leg. Uh, your, your engine blows up. That's an act of God. Persecution is bad that comes to you, but it's directed by a person. It would be like what he's doing for me. Okay? I'm not persecuting him. I am. Let me ask you something. Were any of you asked to email his church today and give them down the road? Did any of you, did you, did any of you, you said, you need to, to email that church and say, they need to fire Stephen Anderson. Why haven't we done that? Because we don't do that. The maniac does that. Would you want to be in that room with him when he was like that? I mean, that guy's scary. Yeah. But here's the thing, guys. I, so, so this is, this is I call this man-made grief. But, am I right? All are, or are these both the same? Well, you know what would help? It'd help if we had like a final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And it just so happens that our final authority in all matters of faith and practice, look at Mark chapter 4. And in Mark chapter 4, you know what it is? It's the parallel passage to Matthew chapter 13. And you can't find the word tribulation in it. It says this in verse 17. That have no root in them, and so endure for a, while, for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arise for the word's sake. Now number one, what I want you to notice I took the same, same story in two different books. I did not even, it is the same context, is it not? So nobody can say I, I went someplace else and that I misapplied a scripture. These are talking about the very same thing, one in Matthew, one in Mark, and the word persecution, man-made grief stays there, but this one is changed to affliction. But if you have, if you have diabetes, if you have leukemia, my pastor's been fighting leukemia for 17 years. Nobody gave it to him. He got it. It's an affliction. It's a tribulation. It's not the tribulation. So it is that. Tribulation is one thing. Persecution is another. And, he, and here's why they do this. Because when he taught that, that's when he is trying to pick a fight with the border guards. Then when he gets beat up, he goes, look, I've been persecuted. I'm going through tribulation. You know, I told you, one of the things about these guys, and I'll bet you he can't. I wish somebody called him up and say, hey, how are we going to know when tribulation starts? Is there going to be a big green flag? Go. <laughs> you Christians, for three and a half years, run. <laughs> uh, you know what's wrong with Americans? We think that when the gas prices go up, tribulation is hit. So, so tribulation and persecution are not the same. Because your Bible doesn't define them as the same. Then he's got this, bait and switch. Go to John chapter 16. And what he says here, uh, like I said, I, I, I don't think the guy, you know, I, I don't say he's on drugs. I just say he should get on drugs. Now, see, if you found out that he was on drugs when he did that, or if he had bad med, wouldn't you go, well, that makes sense. Oh, he's probably a diabetic and didn't get a shot. You know, he's up on sugar or something. It would make sense, right? But I think, that, I think he's just like nuts. And here's what he says. Uh, look, at, look at the verse one, verse 1. These things have I spoken to you, 
that you should not be offended. Okay? Now, look what the Lord says in verse 16. And in verse 16, let me get this. In verse 16, he says this in verse 33, the Lord. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, is there a thinking, normal person in this room that thinks when the Lord said, ye shall have tribulation, he's talking about the tribulation? Because if he is, Jesus was wrong. Because the people he said that to never went through the tribulation. And Jesus stood right there and said, you're going through the tribulation. Then why didn't the tribulation happen in the days of those guys? So it's not the tribulation. So this guy has Jesus mistaken. I've never said he did that one. Anyway, but here's the kick. He says, he goes, he says this about verse 1. Jesus, these things have I written unto you that, you that you should not be offended. He said, Jesus is saying that so they won't be offended when they find out they're go that they're going through the tribulation. But he says, these things have I spoken. And he's 32 verses away from saying, in the world you have tribulation. How can he say, these things have I spoken, and he hadn't spoken it yet? He didn't speak until the last verse of the chapter. How can you would never do that. A sane person, a sober person, a normal person would not do that. Now, if you're a crook trying to push a doctrine that the Bible doesn't push, you would do that. These things have I spoken unto you. That wouldn't that make you... Look, let me ask you a question. If, you, if, I said, if I said to all of you, before I told you this, if I said, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. I said, would somebody go home tonight and come back tomorrow and tell us what Jesus was talking about? Would any of you go, well, I need to see what he says later in this chapter? Wouldn't you say, I think I'll look at what he just said. And you know what he just said? You know the two most outstanding things about verse 15, uh, chapter 15? If we just go back to that. If we just go back to chapter 15, he talks about two things. Us dying for each other. Loving one another. And the Holy Spirit coming down, the Comforter. These things, he says. Not that I said. That I've spoken. Not these that I've spoken. And he hadn't spoken them. But if the guy can get... If, and I, I'm sorry. You know, I'm trying not to be ugly with the people that follow him. But if you say, oh, well, and okay, you, what does he say? Well, if you just say, make excuse, well, how do you make excuse for that? These guys all make excuse for everything this guy does. I asked a guy today, I said, what do you do? I, I, asked, a, I asked one of his buddies, I said, uh, I said are you going to get saved? He said, I am saved. I said, no, you're not. He said, I am too. I said, no, you're not. He said, I, I'm saved. I said, your boss says you're not. Because you sat in the service last night and didn't stand up and stop me. Boy, you better never stand up and stop me. But the fact is, I said, he said, everybody in that church last night is lost. Now, I don't know how you feel when somebody says that you're lost. Personally, personally, I, I think it's the nuclear option. It, I am happy. Because what more can he say? I mean, what's he going to call me, a big fat animal or something? <laughs> There went the love offering right there, buddy. <laughs> I don't tell you to watch this stuff because it's really a waste of time. I don't watch, my, I watch this because I had to do this. People send me good videos and they say, here, watch this and it's an hour and a half. I don't, I don't watch videos that are half an hour. I, look, man, I'm dying. Okay? Right. Say of what? Life. Right. I'm dying. I've only got so many minutes and I'm not wasting them watching a video. But if you watch that video, here's what you find out. It's not a video, it's two videos. You get about, I think, 30, 39 minutes in, and really his after the tribulation video ends, and a new one picks up, and it's his teacher on Revelation. And I didn't get much passed into that because, because now I know he's off somewhere, uh, somewhere else. But he says this, and guys, I, again, if the guy is not sniffing glue, I don't know what he's doing. He must, he must snort coke just before he studies his Bible. How many chapters are there in, uh, uh, in the book of Revelation? 
22. He, ha- he says, here's a simple outline to understand the book of Revelation. He said, you put, you put two columns, 11, chapters 1 through 11 here, chapter 12 through 22, so you got, and he said, these chapters are all the same. These match each other. Chapter 1 and chapter 12 go together. They're parallel. Chapter 2 and chapter 13, chapter 3 and chapter 4, or chapter 4 and chapter 15, chapter 5 and chapter 16. I will not tell you that's not true. I will, this is one place where I will challenge you. Read chapter 1, then read chapter 12, and if you find they're the same, you're smoking something. (laughs) And if you can somehow twist it so it is, then read chapter 2 and read chapter 13. And read chapter 11. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, here's, uh, here you got, the, you got the, the two witnesses, and they're getting their head cut off, and here you got the new heaven, new Jerusalem. Oh, that's a lot alike. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you guys, I don't know what the guy... This is what happens when a maniac gets a camera. Right, right. See, if there was no internet, he'd be out in the desert where he belongs. Right. Now he's trying to get me out of the ministry. You know what he doesn't know? You know what I've been saying for years? Look, my next open week... Stephen is 2027. I am booking meetings for 2027. I will be 77 years old. That's not atrocious. What's atrocious is I'll still have the same seven sermons. (laughs) And, And I tell people, I said, you know, I'm about to start a rumor about myself so I can cut back on some of the meetings. And I guess I don't have to. He's going to do it for me. And, and I'm, I, I'm thinking, man, I, I hope it works. <laughs> you know? I, I said, well, what are you going to do if he puts you out of business? I, I don't know. Maybe like, go start a church in Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people who need some Bible teaching. Yeah. All right. Uh, guys, can you pass those out? We've got some stuff where we look at, I'm about done. It's not you people I care about, but those poor nursery workers. They understand why GIP is a four letter word. (laughs) Now, as, as, as they pass those out, I have a question. My question is this, who, who is our Apostle, Paul. Uh, We find out about the Lord's Supper by reading Paul, how we should have it. We find out about uh, about getting baptized. We find out, look, you have probably led somebody to Christ using the Romans road. Did anybody ever use the Matthews road? No. No. Uh, We find out about church polity with Paul. Uh, We find out how we should live with Paul. We find out that we should love one another. Love one another with Paul. So he is our guy. Now think about this. We are in, in the time that Paul writes to us. And I'm not, I'm not saying that we take Paul and, and dispense with the other Bible, I'm, uh, the, the rest of the Bible. I don't believe that. He says I believe that, but he has to say that. And um, anyway, if we're going through the tribulation, who should warn us? Paul, brother, he never says a word. He never breathes one word of warning. Now, some of these I'm going to give you that are not on the list, and I'll read them, just, I'll just read them a little bit, and then we'll look in the list in a little bit, and then I'll, I'll let you go. But in um, 1 Corinthians 4, Look what he, he says this in verse 14. You can turn it, just mark it down if you want. 1 Corinthians 4, 14. I write these things to shame you, but not, uh, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, to warn you. Okay. He's going to warn them, right? For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have, uh, yet, yet, you're not, yet have you not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, therefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. 
He says, I'm going to warn you. Is he going to warn them? Why didn't he say, I'm going to warn you that you're going halfway through the tribulation? Instead, he says, I'm going to warn you that you follow me. Talking about himself. Whenever he, he has some perfect opportunities when he talks about end times to mention the tribulation, never breathes a word. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Same, same chapter, same verse. Different book. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 14, knowing that, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with him. Wouldn't that have been a good place to say something about after three and a half years of really bad sushi? I mean, really, don't you think that would have been a good time when he could have said, we're going up there after three and a half years of tribulation? But he never breathes a word because we're not going through it. Galatians chapter 4, oh, chapter 6, chapter 6. Now, I told you guys, there's a couple of verses that we classically misapply. I'm not against that. As long as you know the, the proper application, as long as you know, you know, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, I behold, I stand at the door and knock. As long as you know that's talking about the Lord trying to get through to somebody in this dispensation, this church age, this church, it's trying to get through a safe person, have some fellowship. I'm not going to, if we went soul winning and you quoted that to a lost guy, let me ask you something. Doesn't the Lord want to get in his heart? Well, I don't know if he's knocking or tapping his foot or whistling, but whatever, you can go ahead and do it, as long as you know what it really means. There's another one we say. There's a verse here that, that we constantly misapply because it's really good judgment verse. Verse 7, Galatians 3, uh, 6, 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, don't we use that one to say, boy, you guys are living like hell, and you guys are living in sin. It's, you're going to reap that, right? It's the exact opposite. Look at the next verse. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Look at 9. But let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap uh, if we faint not. Some of you people, I'll bet you you got people in here, you come, you, really, these nursery workers, you, you soul winners, you bus workers. I'll bet there's times you say, you know what? I think I'm just going to quit. I'm just, I'm just done. And you know what Paul says? No, no, don't quit. Don't be weary in well-doing because if you'll just keep knocking on the doors, if you'll just keep picking up the kids, you will in due season reap if you faint not. But he doesn't say anything about we're going through the tribulation. There's nothing about a future tribulation for us. Now I'm going to pass. I've got a list of only 32 of them that I'm going to pass on. And we'll go to this list that you have a copy of. On the first page, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6, let no man deceive you with vain words. Whoa, that's a good text for uh, what you just saw before the service. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Why doesn't he say the wrath of God? Upon, oh, oh, maybe only the disobedient children are going to go through the first half of tribulation. Now, there'd be a good doctrine. I imagine Steve and I will both be here. Anyway, but think about this. There it is, the wrath of God. I told you, there is tribulation and the tribulation, a period of time, seven years long, that is known as the tribulation, the great tribulation, or the time of Jacob's trouble. There's no place in, in Scripture where a, place, a, a, a time called the wrath is identified. It talks about the wrath of God because you have to say the in front of it. And so here's somebody who's going to get the wrath, but it's not the tribulation. Uh, look down at the bottom, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching. Oh, here we go. Watching for the tribulation to show up. Watching Stephen Anderson videos on the internet. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Doesn't the Bible, isn't this the guy that says we should watch? But when he said watch there, he didn't say anything about tribulation because that's not what it's about. Why did, why did this man never warn us about going through the tribulation? You're very apostle. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve all things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. 
He just went right through the tribulation, didn't he? The day of Christ, that's where we go up. What? He just went right through the, that three and a half year tribulation without a comma for it. Why didn't he say, uh, sincere without offense, through the tribulation and then to the day of Christ? Because we're not going through the tribulation. Oh, and, and by the way, and he hasn't replaced Israel either. Philippians chapter 1, verse 25, And having this confidence, I know that you shall abide and continue, um, that I shall uh, abide and continue with you, with you all for your preparation for the tribulation. <laughs> no, for your furtherance and joy of faith. He said, it's, it, you need me to abide in the flesh for you, for your joy in the faith. He doesn't say, you guys are going to... Didn't he say the Lord is at hand? Does that sound like Paul thought the, the Lord's coming back in his day? I have to ask you that, because if I say he did say the Lord's coming back in his day, there'll be a new video out tomorrow. If he thought the Lord was coming back in his day, then he knew he was going to halfway through the tribulation. Why didn't he say something? It's better that I remain with you so that we can go through that tribulation together and I'll help you through that bad time. Because we're not going through it. If we go through it, you and I are going to get to heaven. We're going to hunt Paul down. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, middle of the page, verse 20 and 21. For a conversation is in heaven, for whence also we look for the Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body and make it uh, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to where, uh, the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. No tribulation. You got the change, didn't you? The Lord came back and you got changed. Somewhere between there was supposed to be three and a half year tribulation and it's not in there because it's not in there. Philippians chapter 1 verse 10, that you may approve all things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Zip right there between offense and till is a three and a half year tribulation. That little blank space, three and a half years of tribulation went by. But Paul never said a word. Beware of dogs. Hmm. Beware of evil workers. Mm -hmm. Beware of the concision. Beware of the coming tribulation. Well, wouldn't that have been a place to, good place to add it? Why would this man warn us about so much and not once warn us about tribulation? If we're going through it. Oh, let's see, let's see. Maybe just a couple more. Page three, right about dead center. 1 Thessalonians chapter three, verse four. For verily... When, you were, when, when we were with you, we told you before that we should, suffer pers uh, we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass, and ye know. That makes sense, doesn't it? He suffered tribulation, but not the tribulation. And he never clarifies it, and he never changes it, and he never explains it. Look at page four. First Thessalonians, as, but as touching brotherly love, top, top verse. Uh, as brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, uh, you do it toward all the brethren. As indeed you do it uh, toward all the brethren, which are in all Macedonia. But we, be, we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Now, he's going to tell them what to do. That you study to be quiet. Oh, man, why doesn't, why doesn't Anderson read that verse? And to do your own business. Yeah, well, that would be a good one too. And to work with your own hands, the ones without the nail holes, as we commanded you, that we may walk honestly toward them that are without and that, we, that ye may have, no, have lack of nothing. He tells them, here's what you need to do in the future and never says, and you're going through tribulation. Why doesn't he say, buy some freeze-dried pizza? Well, why doesn't he say you ought to stock something up? Why doesn't he say you better get ready to run? Why doesn't he say you better get ready to get martyred? He doesn't say anything. He doesn't even say something that Stephen Anderson can twist into him saying something. That is how void there, this New Testament is of Paul making references to a three and a half year tribulation that you and I aren't going through anyway. Um, about two-thirds of the way down. Number 19, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn. Good time? Would that be a good time? When somebody says warn? Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Mm -mm. Okay, so maybe I should. Anyway, 
support the weak, be patient toward all men, and I add in here, and warn them about going through the tribulation. <laughs> you say, you can't add to the word of God. Well, he ought to add to it, because he needs to get the tribulation in that New Testament somewhere. Page five. All right, this is it. First Timothy chapter four, verse two. Who we have... Uh, who have all men to be who have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. He said, he said we want them to get saved. Number one, we need to come to the knowledge of the truth. Number two, he doesn't say we want to make we want them to make it through the tribulation. Paul never makes a reference to the tribulation. Paul is our apostle. But Paul does make mention of Stephen Anderson. And John makes mention of Stephen Anderson. Go to 1 Timothy. First Timothy. Uh, guys, you can ask guys where I preach. You can ask your pastor. I don't badmouth people. I mean, I don't badmouth people in private. I don't come to him and say, so-and-so is a, a dirty rat. Or did you hear about this? You know what I tell people? Evangelists are the jungle, the jungle drums of Christianity. We go from church to church and we get all the gossip and we go gossip to gossip to gossip. I don't do that. I was telling in the college today, uh, some guy was talking to me. He said, there's some preacher that doesn't like you. I thought, there was only just one. And um, he said, some guy doesn't like you. He said some, something bad about you. He says, do you want to know who he is? I said, no. He said, well, he claims to be your friend. Don't you want to know who he is? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, because then if something bad happens to him, he won't let me help him. I might not want to. Guys, there are, there are preachers who I help, and I have to do it anonymously, because if they thought the money came from me, they wouldn't take it. I tell people, you know what the difference between loving a brother and liking him is? We're supposed to love each other. Didn't you read it over it? Love, 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 love. Doesn't say you have to like each other. Loving is that we take care of each other and we don't kill each other and we don't hurt each other. Liking is, if you don't like somebody, you don't ask them out for a burger after church. And so if somebody has a house fire, I've said this for years. If somebody doesn't like you, a Christian, if you hear about a Christian that doesn't like you and they have a house fire, that is no reason why you shouldn't help them. I don't see any reason why that would be a reason you would not help them. Well, because they said, so what? The, I told you. Remember I told you the unpardonable sin, the sin unto death is to disagree with me? Is that not what you saw in that video? I have committed the sin unto death. That guy wants me dead. If I die, in a, we fly tomorrow. If our plane crashes, you watch and see if he doesn't lay claim to it. So, so what does the Apostle Paul say? In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 20, he says this, Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. You say, what's blasphemy? I don't know. I mean, everybody, I, apparently I do it real easy. But I would think calling Jesus Christ a liar would be blasphemy. And if he said it as many times as people I'm looking at, He's got a big scorecard to take care of. And here's what I'm saying. Next month will be 47 years of preaching. This is the first time, this is the only single person I've ever come to a pulpit, mention his name from a pulpit, and say something negative to him, negative to him about him. So you can't say, oh, it's personal, and you're just using it. No, no, no. It took 47 years. And I don't care about his church. I don't want his church to fold, okay? If he, if he will stop sending people into your church, right. if he will stop sending people to, and I'm telling you, around the world. When I first did the, the, a, a video on this, I heard from Australia, China, and England. I was just in Australia a couple of years ago, and they said, he has given us fits over the internet. He is a wolf. Yeah, right. And there are times... And I know this is very easy. So that's it. Well, whenever you want to badmouth somebody, you just quote that verse. I haven't done it in 47 years. Look at, look at 2 Timothy.
chapter 2. Once again, verse 17. And their word doth eat as a, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Hymenaeus must have been a real bad case. He probably mid tribulation rapture. So Paul does say there comes a time, and I'm telling you guys, when I go into when I go into church after church after church after church, and they all say the same guy has taken our people. When they say he is set, you know what he, he says? Come into a church, join it, and start putting his stuff out. His church is not growing from Phoenix. It's growing from Chicago. It's growing from, it's growing from Atlanta. It's growing from Michigan. It's growing from all over the country because he is starting a cult. And all cults believe this. I don't care what they believe. All the rules can be different for a cult, but there's one rule that is always the same with a cult. Disagree with the leader, you're damned. Now you look at any cult, and you disagree with the leader, and you're damned. And you are damned. That's what he said for not agreeing with him. And is there, is there anybody that is, did you ever, did anybody at least go and key his car? Have any of you even sent him an ugly email? You have done absolutely nothing, and the Gestapo has damned your soul to hell. And he, and he makes, he has to twist up what I say. And there it is. And then somebody's going to call me and go, I need clarification. Get some clarification on that. But I told you John does mention him. And John does mention him. I'm looking for my last piece of paper here. In uh, Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, look at verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Chapter 3, verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So yes, you got him in the Bible. John mentions him. Paul mentions some the people like him. And I'm telling you this, guys, the guy is, uh, well, you, you, you saw him. I don't have to do a whole lot. I want to oh, show you one last thing. I want to show you he accepted the deal that Jesus Christ refused. Look at, look at uh, Luke chapter 4. Look at Luke chapter 4. Stephen Anderson accepted the deal that Jesus Christ said no to. Luke chapter 4 is the Lord being tempted in the wilderness by Satan. Took two weeks off from Phoenix and showed up. <laughs> oh, put that in the video, Steve. Put that in the video. Anyway, look what the, look what the devil did. Verse, 10, uh, verse, verse 5. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them... For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Now the love of money is the root of all evil. But the guy's got the money. He's a millionaire. That's why he does, if he, see he can't handle it. He doesn't have time in this meeting. He doesn't have time for his production people to make up a new video. You watch and see. There's going to be a first class video of these, of these services. And, and he'll have those, you know, he'll have the 20 second sound bites. And he'll have him saying something he didn't say and have me saying something because he, he isn't his own man. He's a kept man. But he's got the money. But I got news for you, people. People want more than money. They want power and they want glory. That's why they run. Why would people run for Congress and take a pay cut? And why do people go out there and beat their bodies up on a sports field? Because they want power 
and they want glory. Okay, so the Lord says, and doesn't it say the devil, didn't it, didn't it say he's got the power to do it? Verse 7, if thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. All right, let me ask you a question. Didn't Jesus Christ just put, did he not just refuse power and glory? Sure did. It's been a good deal for a bunch of people. But you know what I tell people all the time? Be honest and, and, um, and don't cheat. When you cheat, there's no shortcut to, to, to success. Just be honest and don't take any shortcuts and don't cheat. So he just lost the, the chance on power and glory, right? Look at verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Wow, he refused the devil's power and look at the power that he got. Power of the Spirit, now, now, now Anderson will say Jesus had no power. And I'm gonna, I teach that Jesus had no power and the Holy Spirit gave it to him there. That's what I'm saying. In the power of the Spirit, so he came in the power. I guess that's maybe that's just a car. The power of the Spirit into Galilee where there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues being glorified of all. The devil says, I'll give you power and glory. Lord Jesus Christ said, hit the road, pal. And he got power and glory. Anderson didn't turn that deal down. All right, preacher. Stand, please. Bow heads of prayer, please. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I too have never used my pulpit for name calling or calling anyone out like that. But something has to be done when he's affecting young men and minds of mush and those who can't think for their own. You know, here, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to give the invitation tonight except to say that some of you ought to come and, and dedicate yourself afresh and new to the Word of God and study in the Word of God and understand that so you cannot be hoodwinked by these individuals. I've got, I've got folks in this church right now that's here tonight that was into the charismatic movement until I talked to them and showed them scripturally. There are many of us in this room that have been saved by the grace of God, led you to the Lord, that were just off totally doctrinally until we showed you how to be saved and then you've been taught doctrinally. And there's some of you just don't, you're just part of it. That's what happened when I got saved out of Romanism. I wasn't going to be hoodwinked anymore. I got in that book immediately. As soon as I got saved, I started doing deep doc doctrinal studies immediately. Wasn't going to be hoodwinked. Some of you ought to come dedicate yourself to that final authority that you carry every day of your life. So you won't be shaken about with every wind of doctrine. You ought to come tonight. Maybe you're here and you're not saved. Maybe you'd like to be saved. You ought to come tonight. Whatever your need is, you make sure that you do. Father, bless, Lord, uh, the invitation now we ask in Jesus' name, and amen. As we place off, if you need to come, you come on, visit this altar if you need to. Dedicate yourself afresh and anew. Be good.
Brother Randy Graham, come to, come to the platform if you would, please. Brother Graham came. We had preachers from Kentucky and different places. Brother Graham came from Michigan. And uh, he and I go way back. I, I don't even know. He, he wouldn't remember me. But uh, his dad, y'all heard me give my testimony. Come on up here, man. Uh, gave my testimony. And you've heard my testimony how I walked in a long-haired hippie boy. And, and uh, I said often when I walked in, women grabbed their children and men their wallets. I was a wild man. And um, his dad was leading the singing for Bob Smith back then. And then his dad got up to sing the special. And I was sitting out there and never been in a Baptist church in my life. And Dr. Bob Smith opened that book. But when his daddy sang the song, his daddy got broke up, started weeping. And couldn't, you know, kind of fumble around as singers do at times. And the first thing I said, I said, boy, he sure botched that performance. That's what I thought he was doing, performing. And then almost immediately, it's like, that ain't performing, man. Amen. This guy really means what he's singing. It, it's got him. Then I kind of settled in a little bit and started listening. And then Bob Smith got up and preached on Amos 3, 3, can two walk together except to be agreed. And I got saved that day. How old were you then? You were a little bitty baby. Four years old. He was four years old then. So he wouldn't remember me necessarily at that time. But uh, now he's pastoring Amen. up in Michigan. Now, how long? How, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, excuse you. How many, how many years now? 15 years. 15 years in Wisconsin. Isn't that amazing? So I'm glad he's here. I'm glad he was here for the conference. You go ahead and, and uh, close and pray if you would. Or pray for the offering if you would. You Come on right now if you would, please. Um, everything in the, um, I don't have my... Notes up here. Sarah, what do we need for this week? bunch of lost heathen. I've been telling y'all that for a long time, man. <laughs> y'all stand, please. And I'm, I'm apologizing. Missionary, get up here. What are you doing, visiting? Missionary, you. What are you doing? Get up here. Get up here. What are you doing here? 
You're supposed to be on a mission field winning souls or something. What are you doing? You come check on your daughter. We're taking good care of her. We're not giving her back. She's too good of a girl. How you doing, man? Good, good to see you. You got a report for us, or you just been running around the nation? Uh, I just came back for her. Oh, but <laughs> so you gonna take her away? I've learned some African tri tricks over there. Good. All right. With your friends. I want you to say a word or two to them, and then I want you to close in prayer. Thank y'all for being here. You, you folks that were here uh, all through the week, thank you very, very much, and and I certainly appreciate you being here. Make sure you take care of the the table too, and uh, tell us a little word about what's going on in the closing prayer. Uh, Lord's been good to us. We've been there for a year. Come back for Abigail. Thank you for taking care of her and um, any everything else. She's been giving us a bunch of stories and everything. Lord's been good. We've started three churches since last year. Uh, had seven graduates at the end of last year, and three of them said we're going to go start a church. So uh, it's, it's exciting, and we got a couple more at, by the end of this year. They'll be done too. So Lord's good, and He's still on the throne. Amen. Amen. So let's go, Lord, in prayer. Amen. Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness to us tonight. Thank you for your watch and uh, protection that you give over our lives each and every day.